This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. Well, tonight we're going to be in Daniel chapter number 3. And if you weren't able to be here with us last week, just to kind of put it in a nutshell, we saw Nebuchadnezzar's dream vision interpreted for King Nebuchadnezzar by Daniel. And um, it was an exciting dream that was interpreted because it discussed four upcoming empires that would replace Babylon one after another. And it culminated with that fourth one uh, being an empire that is still yet to come in world events, an end times kingdom. And then following that kingdom is the destruction of that kingdom by the kingdom of Christ, the millennium the thousand year reign of Christ that is still yet to come as well. So we got to see just a glimpse of some of the end time prophecies that are recorded in the book of Daniel last week as we looked at the meaning of that dream vision that Nebuchadnezzar had. That really is just the tip of the iceberg of the prophecy that we will see revealed in the book of Daniel. But hopefully it was enough to whet your appetite a little bit. And if you weren't able to be here uh, last week, Uh, Hopefully by tomorrow afternoon, last week's uh, lesson that didn't get put up online last week because of uh, folks being busy will be up, and if you want to, you can listen to what you missed last week online. But tonight, if you, as though it couldn't get more exciting than it was last week, it's going to be, I think, just as exciting or more exciting tonight as we see this famous story unfold before us of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the fiery furnace. But I believe by the time we finish tonight, hopefully you will have seen some things that you never saw in the story before. So let's dig right in with Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. All right, now I know we are only one verse in, but we need to stop here and talk about this image that was set up. It obviously is some type of a statue that was erected by King Nebuchadnezzar. And the Bible records for us here the dimensions of this statue, at least the height and the breadth of it. So what is the height of this statue? All right, so three score would be, how much is a score? Yeah, it'd be 60 because a score is 20. So 60 cubits high. And how many cubits wide, the breadth of it? Six. Six cubits wide. Now, someone remind us, if you would, what what are the standard dimensions in English metrics for a cubit? That's pretty close, uh, Milton. 18 is what I think we normally go with. It's a cubit was supposed to be the median distance between the tip of your middle finger to the tip of the elbow on an average man. And so it's approximated to be about 18 inches, about a foot and a half. So if we convert this to English measurements, this 60 cubits becomes a Approximately how many feet? Uh, about 90 feet. About 90 feet. A cubit being a foot and a half. So, so, so uh, 60 cubits, about 90 foot tall. That's pretty tall, by the way. If you assume that the average story of a building is about 10 feet, that'd be a, a nine-story building. So that's a pretty tall statue. Six cubits would then convert to how many feet approximately? Approximately nine feet wide. 
I want to point out several things here. First of all, this is a very tall statue. The Colossus of Rhodes, a statue from the ancient world that is regarded as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, a statue that was located on the island of Rhodes right off the uh, the coast in the Aegean Sea there near Greece, it is considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and it was only 70 cubits tall. So this statue that Nebuchadnezzar has erected is very close to being as tall as that one of the seven wonders of the world, the Colossus. It says that it was made of gold. In all likelihood, what was the case here is that it would have been similarly made to the Ark of the Covenant and other things that we read about, not only in the Bible, but in ancient history. It would have been made of wood and then overlaid with gold. But that's still a lot of gold to cover a statue that's 90 foot tall and 9 foot wide. That's still quite a lot of gold it would take just to cover such a statue. You can imagine seeing that statue in the sunlight, how dazzling it must have been. If you've ever, well I know you all have, you've driven through Atlanta and seen the gold dome there on the Capitol building. Um, Several years ago when they redid that gold leaf that covers the dome, it's now so brightly polished gold compared to what it was before they redid it, it glitters in the sun. You can imagine seeing this statue of gold in the sunlight there in person. It must have been quite a spectacle. Not only was it so incredibly tall, but it's glistening in the sun and brightly shining as well. I notice here that the measurements are 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide. 66. Now, apart from the fact that that was my football number in high school, I think it's uh, significant for more reasons because the number six in, in Bible terms in Scripture is very uh, often associated with what? What does the book of Revelation tell us six is the number of? Well, six is the number of man which is, which is uh, con- uh, controlled by Satan. T.R., what you... Well, it's very close to being the number of the beast, isn't it, if we just added another six on there. But the number six itself is the number of man. And if you read in the book of Revelation where it's talking about the mark of the beast that T.R. just referenced, it tells us that uh, it's the number of a man. So the number six, we know from the fact that how it's referred to in Revelation in conjunction with the mark of the beast, this 60 by 6 is very obviously uh, an indication this is not of God. Of course, we know it's not of God because Nebuchadnezzar is not erecting a statue to Jehovah God, Yahweh. He's erecting a statue that has nothing to do with the God of the Bible. It's very obviously an inconspicuous fact of sorts that this is ungodly. It has to do with something other than God. And when I uh, explain a little bit more about what this statue likely was, I think it will make even more sense. The Bible doesn't tell us here what the statue was. Some have speculated that perhaps it was the statue intended to be in the likeness of Nebuchadnezzar himself. In fact, I can remember in Sunday school as a boy growing up hearing that It was a statue of Nebuchadnezzar, intended to be worshipped. But I think when we get a little farther down in the chapter, we may see an indication that that might not be the case. In fact, I want to submit to you a different possibility that I think is more likely than it being a statue of Nebuchadnezzar. I think in all likelihood, it was probably not a statue of Nebuchadnezzar, but a statue of the leading deity or god, of Babylon, Marduk. Now let me tell you a little bit about Marduk in the whole scheme of the uh, pagan gods and goddesses, if I may. 
Those of you that might have been here some during the summer months on Wednesday nights, when I taught through a short series on Mystery Babylon from the book of Revelation and from Genesis uh, chapter 11 with the Tower of Babel, we'll remember that in short, all of the world's pagan religions today all trace their roots back to the false religion that was created, begun at the Tower of Babel. And in all of the ancient cultures and civilizations of the uh, world that were around at this time, all of them have very similar stories in their religions. The Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Canaanites, the Phoenicians, even the Greeks and Romans, and the Egyptians. They all have very similar stories about their gods and goddesses. They just basically change the names from one culture to another. I want to tell you just a little bit about the story of Marduk from the Babylonian religion perspective and how it compares, how he compares to some of the other false gods and goddesses we know, even from the Old Testament. Marduk was said to have been the patron god of the city of Babylon. But originally, he was considered one of the young gods of the pagan world. It is said that the original creator of the world was a chaotic god, a god that was very much malevolent towards the other gods that existed before mankind, and that the creator of the earth was this God that was in fact in feminine form, so we could say a goddess, and that the other gods got together realizing that the creator was going to destroy the rest of them, unless they did something to prevent it. One after another, different ones of the ancient pagan gods stepped forward to try to uh, stop the creator goddess from destroying the rest of the gods of the pagan world. But none of them with any success. Until Marduk stepped forward. Again, a relatively young god in comparison to the other gods of pagan lore. And Marduk stepped forward and said that he would go and destroy this creator god who was so malevolent and so chaotic, if all the other pagan gods agreed that when he was successful, they would make him the king of the gods and give him honor and put him in charge of everything. So they agreed to it. They, in, as the story goes, believed he was their only hope. And if he didn't succeed, they were all going to be destroyed by this malevolent, chaotic God who was the Creator. So he goes out and he does battle against this uh, Creator Goddess. And he takes this chaotic God and he uses a couple of special weapons to do battle. One of them is a net, a special net in which he captures this goddess in his net. In other words, he takes the chaos and brings it under control so that it can be controlled and dealt with. He creates order out of chaos. And in so doing, he destroys this creator god he then becomes the official king of the gods. He is given 50 different names according to the ancient legend. Marduk, I submit to you, is known by many different names in the ancient world. His story is almost the same from one civilization to the next. But let me write some of the other names up here and see if you don't recognize some of them. The Canaanites in the Old Testament that we read about had a god that they referred to that was identical to Marduk. His name in the Old Testament is Baal. 
You've all read about Baal. He was the god of the Philistines and the other Canaanites who dwelt in the land of Israel when they went in to possess the land. Marduk is also not only a reference to Baal of the Canaanites, but in the Egyptian world, he would be the equivalent of Osiris. He's also referred to in the Babylonian terms as Baal. He's also referred to as Jupiter. And by the way, almost simultaneously associated not only with Jupiter, but also with Saturn. But this god Marduk, who is this king of the gods in all of these ancient religions, though the names change, the story stays the same. He is, uh, he is normally pictured with several different things on or around him in the, uh, the carvings that are still found, the monuments that are still in existence. One of the symbols of Marduk is the sunburst. You'll see that in a lot of the ancient relief carvings. You also see this very frequently associated with Roman Catholic iconography. The sunburst. He also was referred to as the, the sun god. Or in some instances, not just the sun god, which is portrayed by the sunburst there, but as the solar calf, C-A-L-F, an animal, a calf. And many times was portrayed as a golden calf. I think you'll remember a golden calf or two from the Bible as well. The, the golden calf worship was not something that the children of Israel started at the foot of Mount Sinai while Moses was up there getting the Ten Commandments. The worship of the golden calf was something they had brought with them out of Egypt because they had seen the Egyptians doing it. You'll remember that where uh, here's the coast of Egypt, here's the Nile Delta, the children of Israel had been given this very fertile part of the land of Egypt to dwell when Joseph first brought his family down to Egypt. The place where the temple to the golden calf was uh, the largest temple in Egypt was located about right there just outside of the land of Goshen in Egypt before they departed from Egypt. So I can assure you that the children of Israel were very familiar with the worship of the golden calf back in Egypt. In fact, one of the very interesting things about it is the, the Pharaoh that is believed to have been the Pharaoh when the children of Israel came out of the land during the Exodus, Ramses, uh, he is the one who personally had this temple to the golden calf built. So not only was the golden calf being worshipped in Egypt before they came out during the Exodus, but it was something that was going on contemporary with the time they came out of Egypt. It was going on, it was a current event kind of thing. And uh, that temple, by the way, to the golden calf that was worshipped there in Egypt they basically had taken the religion from Babylon and brought it into Egypt and adopted it as their own because it fit right in with their worship of Osiris. And the calves were, uh, in some way, they were picturing Osiris as well. Because one of the other names for Marduk or Osiris or Baal, just as he was in the Old Testament when he was called Moloch, the one to whom they offered child sacrifice, he was also known as the horned god. Almost like a minotaur with a bull's head and horns and a man's body. By the way, Baphomet, the picture of Satan that witches and 
Wiccans worship is always a man's body with a goat's head or a bull's head with horns. It's the same God. It's Satan. So you see who Marduk is. His religion as the king of the gods, he's nothing more than the embodiment uh, of Satan, Lucifer. He is not only portrayed as either being a, a calf or having a sunburst with him in the reliefs that are engraven. He sometimes is portrayed as having right beside him a pet dragon. Of course, we know in Scripture, the dragon is always associated with Satan himself. He's called the great dragon in Revelation chapter 12. And so, this is the man of Satan. Satan, Lucifer, being portrayed as the dragon, this is his man. I think very similar to what we would say the Antichrist will be one day in the end times during the tribulation period. So this being the the number one God of the city of Babylon, I'm almost certain that the image that Nebuchadnezzar had erected there was not an image of Nebuchadnezzar. And I'll give you some more proof as we go through the passage. I think in all likelihood this was probably a golden image of Marduk. And if you look him up online and Google Marduk and look under the images, you'll see some pictures of a man that is Marduk in the ancient Babylonian carvings. I think this was probably the statue, the image that Nebuchadnezzar had made of gold. By the way, as the patron god of Babylon, he had his own temple in the city of Babylon even before Nebuchadnezzar came on the scene. Before Nebuchadnezzar became the king of Babylon, the statue of Marduk had been stolen away from Babylon by the Assyrians, who were a greater power before Babylon came to power. They had conquered the city of Babylon and took their god with them took it back to Assyria, to the city of Asher. Well then, later on, the the statue of Marduk that had been in Babylon was stolen by the Elamites, which by the way is today's Persians, which are Iran. When Nebuchadnezzar became the king of Babylon, one of the things he prided himself on is he went to Elam and took back the statue of Marduk and brought him back to Babylon. Again, that's not much of a God if you have to go rescue him and bring him home. But nevertheless, that's what they believed, that their gods were embodied in the statue and had to be housed in a temple. They even had their own uh, carriages that carried the statues of their gods from place to place because they thought it was the actual embodiment of their god. So because Nebuchadnezzar so revered Marduk that he went out and rescued his statue and brought him back, I feel very confident that this was the image that Nebuchadnezzar had erected there that was so tall and made of fine gold there on the plain of Dura. I want to say one last thing about Marduk and then I'll be done with him and we'll move back to the text here. In that story of Marduk winning the victory over that malevolent creator god or goddess, I think we actually see the same picture that Satan has tried to inculcate upon humankind since the beginning too. That he's not really the bad guy, he's actually the good guy. Because you see in the story, the Creator God was the one Marduk had to go destroy. The Creator was malevolent, evil, wicked, mean. And Satan was the soldier of light. Isn't that how Lucifer portrays himself to mankind? As an angel of light. 
the good guy. Jehovah's the bad guy. Satan's on our side. He's the good guy. Not only that, but the way he defeated the God who was the Creator was by using that net to to destroy the chaos of the Creator God and bring order to it. Many, many of the ancient religions have that one phrase as the slogan of many of their gods and goddesses. Order out of chaos. By the way, for better or for worse, it's also the phrase that's on the back of the one dollar bill. The great seal of these United States. And some have said that it's evidence that the Illuminati was involved in the formation of America in 1776 when they were kicked out of Bavaria over in Europe may or may not be the case. I strongly think it probably is, but that's for another discussion. But the phrase, order out of chaos, is a phrase that has been used by many of the mystery religions for thousands of years. Because that's what Satan claims he is doing for mankind. That God is the author of confusion and Satan is coming to the rescue, bringing order. You and I know it's actually the opposite. But Satan is the father of lies, and that's the great deceit he has tried to bring upon the world. I know that in the story, the Creator is portrayed as the feminine, the goddess. I personally, I thought long and hard about why that would be when God is obviously a masculine figure we see in the Bible. I think perhaps it's just total disrespect towards God to present Him as a feminine character when we know the Creator is not a feminine character. By the way, after Marduk captured, controlled, and destroyed the Creator God, he then, Marduk, created mankind and became the benevolent God of mankind. Again, I think that's a perfect uh, explanation of how Satan presents himself to mankind. God's the bad guy. He's the good guy who came to the rescue. Anyway, enough about Marduk. But all of that together, I think, uh, first of all, hopefully it's more than you already knew. Hopefully you learned something new. But I think that's good evidence to suggest that this was a statue of Marduk that Nebuchadnezzar had built. It was put in the plain of Dura. There are several suggestions that archaeologists have put forth of where Dura might be, but it seems to have been very, very close in proximity to the city of Babylon. Some have suggested it was actually inside the city walls of Babylon, near a ziggurat, which is one of those stepped pyramids that Nebuchadnezzar built in honor of Marduk, which again may lead credibility to the fact that this was a statue of Marduk. But I think the, the best or most convincing archaeological uh, um, evidence that's been presented, it's probably the statue was about six miles to the southeast of the city of Babylon, outside the city, because they've discovered the remains of a huge brick uh, stage or platform of sorts that looks uh, like it very possibly could have been the, uh, the, the base on which this statue stood at one time. Maybe it was there six miles southeast of the city. Maybe it was right inside the city walls. Either way, it's near the city of Babylon in this place called Dura. Verse number 2. That was a lot for verse 1, wasn't it? I promise we're not going to spend that much time on every verse. Verse 2. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So he basically called for all the important dignitaries of the empire to come together for the dedication of this big image, this big statue. And 
you know, I know I just saw a, a news story um, yesterday where one of the pitchers for the uh, world championship baseball team that just won, he said he's not accepting President Trump's invitation to go to the White House. Well, he may or may not accept that invitation, but I assure you, when Nebuchadnezzar was the king, you didn't get a choice whether you were going to the White House. When Nebuchadnezzar said, everybody's coming to the White House, everybody was going to the White House. At least all that he said were going, were going to see the dedication to this statue. So he calls for all the dignitaries all over to, to come together. Verse 3, Then the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So here's the statue standing there. They're all out in front of it, looking at it. Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages. By the way, there were more than just Babylonians there because they had conquered quite a few other people by this time. So all the people they had conquered were represented there. So this herald, he is announcing to everyone there, no matter who you are, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. All right, now I'm going to submit, I know this isn't total evidence, but again, I think the fact he's telling them to bow down to the image is another evidence that this is Nebuchadnezzar's God he's wanting them to worship. I know you could say, well, it's an image of the king, he's wanting them to bow down to the king. We're going to continue reading here, but I think Nebuchadnezzar is wanting them to bow down to his God that he just went and rescued from the Elamites that is so important to him. By the way, these different uh, musical instruments that you see there, uh, I, I'm pretty familiar with most of them, but I had to go look up a sackbut. Anybody know what a sackbut instrument was? Well, a modern sackbut instrument is uh, it's one of those uh, uh, things you play with the slide on it. A trombone. Thank you, Brother John. Uh, but apparently, there were some ancient sack butts before modern history that were actually stringed instruments. They're made from a, a, a plant called a sambuk, S-A-M-B-U-K-E, and it has hollow, uh, hollow stem, I guess kind of like a cane pole. And um, they, they used to make both wind instruments that you blew and stringed instruments that you played. So... In all likelihood, it probably wasn't a modern trombone. It was probably more of some kind of a stringed instrument or something similar to a flute with that, uh, that hollow uh, wood being played. Anyway, I think you probably know what the other uh, instruments are. So they're supposed to uh, hear, they're going to hear the music. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Now, the king means business there, doesn't he? I'm pretty sure he meant business, or he wouldn't have had the herald say this. And I kind of wondered, you know, these folks know why they're there. I'm not so sure that the herald had to actually tell them there's, a, there's going to be a punishment if you don't do this. I'm pretty sure most of them were going to do whatever they were told to do anyway because Nebuchadnezzar ruled like most of those ancient eastern kings. He ruled with uh, an iron rod, an iron fist. There was no questioning the word of the king. Remember in the old Ten Commandments movie uh, with Charlton Heston, Pharaoh, let it be written, let it be done. Whatever the king said, that was what was to be done. Anyway, they give them the, the punishment. If they don't bow down and worship, they'd be thrown the same hour into the midst of a burning, fire, burning, fiery furnace. By the way, I guess that'd be a good way to make an example out of somebody. 
you've got the dignitaries of the whole kingdom in one place, and now anybody that doesn't uh, go along with the king, we're going to make an example out of them in front of everybody. Verse number 7. Therefore at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So, they all know the rules. They all bow down when they hear the music. Verse 8. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near. Now, who are the Chaldeans? That's right. That's the actual ethnic group to which the Babylonians belong. The Chaldeans are the Babylonians. They came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. I guess that would, that would always be a good idea for that to be the first words out of your mouth when you're talking to a tyrant. O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, Tax but psaltery and dulcimer and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, then he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now do you remember them being set over the province of Babylon at the end of chapter 2, if you were here last week? At the end of chapter 2, when Daniel interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream for him, uh, Nebuchadnezzar made Daniel the number two man in the kingdom, second only to the king. And at Daniel's request, the king also gave Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his companions, special authority and positions in the province of the capital, Babylon. These men, back to verse 12, These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now that right there is, I think, the greatest evidence in the text that this was a statue of Marduk. I don't think it was a statue of King Nebuchadnezzar because these men that are accusing the Jews of not bowing down, look what they said. These men, O king, have not regarded thee, They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. If this was just about worshiping the king, bowing down to the king, I don't think they would have mentioned his gods. I think the fact that they mentioned his gods to a great degree uh, is some indication this was probably a statue of Marduk. T.R.? Or your image, or they said that, but calling it something as itself, kind of separating itself from the king's name, that kind of relates to it. I think you're probably right. It seems to indicate it was not something related to the king, but to his gods. I think you're right, T.R. By the way, you don't have to agree with the preacher on that, uh, but uh, you're welcome to believe whatever you want to. Verse 13, Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Now, I'm not so sure, I've read this and reread it, I'm not so sure that when he first had them brought before him, that he knew before they were standing there that it was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego they were talking about. But when he found out somebody wasn't bowing down, like the king said to bow down, he was full of rage and fury. Then these three are brought before him. Verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? See, there again, I think he's saying this image has to do with his gods. To me, that seems to be pretty clear here. Is it true, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the image which I've set up? 
So he's given them a chance to say, uh, King, we, we misunderstood. Or King, uh, no, 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 of course we worship your gods and we'll be happy to bow down. He continues, verse 15. Now if ye be ready that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made, well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? I think Nebuchadnezzar thought quite highly of himself. In fact, not only did he think highly of himself, I'm not sure he even believed in his own gods, to be quite honest with you. He didn't think there were any gods that could deliver anybody out of his hands. On this earth anyway. He thought that in this world, he was supreme. He didn't think there was any God that could deliver anyone out of His hand right there and then. Because He was just like so many people in the world today that are unsaved, and maybe even some Christians. They only believe in what they can see, touch, and feel right now in the here. They don't really believe in what's to come. That it's real. That God is real. That the supernatural is real. He certainly didn't believe there was any God that was more powerful than he was at that moment. So he's asked him a question. And he said, If you'll bow down and you hear the music, I'm going to give you another chance. That almost seems like a a little bit of a nice thing to do. He's going to give them a second chance to bow down. But if you don't, you'll be thrown that same hour into the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that can deliver you? Look at verse 16. Got to be one of the greatest verses in all the Bible. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. That almost sounds like the opposite of what you'd expect them to say. O king, we're going to be real careful how we answer this. But that's not what they said. They said, King, we don't even have to be careful in how we answer this. We're just going to answer it very plainly for you. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And He will deliver us out of thine hand, O King. You see, they said, our God is able to deliver us even out of your hand and out of your furnace. I think they had faith in God. They believed what they were saying. But look what's even more beautiful about it in the next verse. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. He said, they said, our God is able to deliver us even out of your hand, King, and out of your furnace. And we think He's going to do that. We expect Him to do that. But even if He doesn't see fit to do that, we still won't bow down and worship your image. We need some Christians with that kind of backbone. And I tell you, in the coming months and years, not too far down the road, I think in America we're all going to get the opportunity who call ourselves Christians to show a little bit of that backbone. Because I'm afraid things aren't getting better for Christians. It's only going to continue to get worse, even here in America. We better decide that we're going to take the same stand. Our young people better decide right now what their choice is going to be. And don't wait until that day to make your decision. Make your decision now. What will I do when that day comes? Already have the decision made. So we'll do the right thing. I think this verse also indicates again that this was a statue of one of Nebuchadnezzar's gods and they're refusing to bow down to one of his gods. 
it seems to me that again, that's, that's the case. Verse 18 said, be it, But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods. They keep bringing its gods into it, which leads me to believe that's what the image is about. Nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You see, that, that one phrase there, the form of his visage was changed against them, is the reason that I seem to, I, I, I personally think that when he first heard there were some fellows that didn't bow down, I don't think he initially, when he was full of rage and fury initially, I don't think he knew it was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So when they come before him and they're standing there, I think he realizes, oh, these are Daniel's three friends. I think that's why he gave them a second chance. And I think that's why he uh, was going to give them the opportunity to do it different the next time. But then, when he gives them that opportunity, and they refuse, and not only do they refuse to do it, but they say, our God is more powerful than you. And even if He doesn't deliver us, we're still not going to bow down. You can, I can just see His face becoming more and more flushed, redder and redder, as the seconds ticked by. And when it says His visage, visage toward them was changed, I think that's an indication that when He had seen it with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, He wanted to be lenient on them. And he wanted to give them another chance. But that when they were defiant to his face, all of that changed. That was all out the window. All bets were off after that. Verse 19, Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more then it was wont to be heated. That's a, a, a fancy way of saying they heated it up seven times more than it should have been heated. More than the usual. Out of the ordinary. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. I wondered myself why he chose the most mighty men that were in the army to do this seemingly innocuous task. I think first of all, he probably had the mighty men of his army right there as his personal guards. I think possibly also, he might have wanted to rough them up a little bit in the process. He had them bound. Ready to be cast into the furnace. Verse 21, Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. So they've got all their clothes, they're still fully dressed, except now they're bound and thrown into the furnace. The furnace would have been probably almost, well, it would have been like a room that was, had a fire built in it either with wood or coal or something that would burn. And this room would be heated up, and probably, even though this is ancient times, they probably had the equivalent of ducks that would run throughout the palace, either under the floors or through the walls, so that the heat from this furnace room would radiate through to the other rooms in the king's palace. It was probably like opening uh, maybe double doors on it. And there was the fire that was burning on the inside. They normally probably threw the wood in or shoveled the coal in or whatever it was they burned. And then they closed the doors again. But it was a big enough room that it would supply enough heat to hopefully heat all the rooms of the king's palace. Must have been a pretty good sized room of sorts. Verse 22, therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, 
and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the men that were such mighty men took them over to the opening there to the furnace. And because the king said he wanted it done now, and because when they opened the doors, the, the heat rushed out. You've opened the, the door on the oven and felt the heat hit you in the face there. This was seven times hotter than it was ever heated before. And the heat by itself killed those men that pushed them into the furnace. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Apparently the, the fellows, the, the mighty men, pushed them in and then they fell down dead. But when they pushed them, it said Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, which is the same as astonished, and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men, but that's not the end of it. Loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. This is an amazing thing that happens because, first of all, he sees, he sees them there loose. The ropes, I would suppose, that had bound them have all burned off and vanished, vaporized. Isn't it interesting that everything else they got on is still there except the ropes? They're loose and walking, walking around in a burning, fiery furnace. And lo, there's four of them. And the fourth is like the Son of God. Now that's what Nebuchadnezzar said. You say, how in the world did he know that the fourth person in there looked like the Son of God? All I can answer that with is, I guess, if, I guess the day that you see the Son of God, you'll know Him too when you see Him. This was either Jesus or it was an angel I personally tend to believe this was the Son of God. The Son of God, not a Son of God, not an angel. This was Jesus in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. So just like we talked about when we were in our Genesis study, this would be a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. That's right. He is, uh, he is God. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, Jesus has been around, He just hasn't had a human body until Bethlehem. This would be before Bethlehem, so He's still Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, but He's not yet taken on a, a body of flesh, human flesh. But He has the appearance of a man, just as we see him at other times in the Old Testament that we already have looked at in our study in Genesis. Verse 26, Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together, saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Now this is the same burning fiery furnace that caused the mighty men in the king's army to fall down dead, just like that. And yet here they come walking out of the burning fiery furnace. They're loosed. There are no more ropes binding them. Their clothes aren't burned. Not a hair on their head was singed. They don't even have the smell of smoke on their clothes. Now that's quite a miracle, isn't it? Verse 
By the way, we mentioned a few minutes ago that probably the reason the king had said, whoever doesn't bow down to the image is going to be thrown this very hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace is because he wanted to make an example of anybody that didn't go along right there while all the dignitaries of the kingdom were there. Well, they're there watching. And they see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into the fiery furnace along with the king. But they also saw them walk back out of the burning fiery furnace too. It, that's right. I suppose they saw the fourth man walking around in there too. They not only saw them thrown into the fiery furnace, they saw them walk out too. Verse 28, Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who had sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word. Now that's a miracle in itself. He didn't think anybody could change the king's commandment. He thought that no one, not even the gods, could deliver someone out of his hand. Remember that... uh, saying that uh, I threw out there kind of uh, jokingly, let it be written, let it be done. Whatever the law of these ancient eastern kings said, whatever their word was, that was the law. There was no appealing it, that was the law. And yet, God overturned. When no one else could, God overturned the word of the king. Nobody would go up I think you're right. I think you're right. And have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree. Now remember, this is a pagan Babylonian king that worships Marduk who is the manifestation of Satan himself. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. That is quite a statement coming from a pagan, unwashed king. He... I don't think becomes a believer in the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But he has now been witness to the power of God when Daniel told him his dream and interpreted it. He's now been witness to the fact that that same God is able to deliver in a way that no other God can deliver. I think God is doing something in Nebuchadnezzar. But I don't think he's a believer at this point. Yes, sir? Yes, sir. Milton is asking, why would these people of the ancient world believe in their gods and goddesses with nothing to base that on? I think you're right, Milton, that a, a large part of it was probably, like you say, that their priests and their false prophets performed magic tricks similar to what Pharaoh's uh, men did there in Egypt and convinced them that they were powerful works of the gods. I also, um, just this past week, I heard another uh, preacher say, uh, give another possible reason that Marduk, Baal, Molech, Osiris, and all these who are really these These gods of the ancient pagans are all fashioned after Nimrod who built the Tower of Babel. He was saying that Nimrod, his wife, Semiramis, and some of the other gods and goddesses of these pagan religions may have actually been originally real-life characters that were that called themselves gods 
or when they died, they were called gods by their followers. And he was suggesting that because right after the flood, people were still living to be much older, and they gradually started living fewer and fewer years, he was surmising that maybe because they were still living right after the flood longer than they were just a couple of generations later, that those couple of generations later might have viewed them as being mighty men or demigods or gods because they lived so much longer than everybody else was living two or three generations later. That may be part of it. It may figure into it. I had never heard that posed before. But I think it's mainly that their magicians and priests had their little magic tricks. I, I will. In fact, I, I don't know when I'll do it, but I already told somebody just about a week ago that at some point I'm going to go back and do a couple more lessons on the Mystery Babylon series I did on Wednesday nights. And I want to talk about the, the whole alien thing. I don't think that the Bible indicates there's any such thing as life anywhere but right here other than in heaven and below the earth. And um, I think undoubtedly, as you indicated, these are fallen angels. They're demons or devils. We'll have to discuss that at a later time because there is room for discussion there. I have some... I have some strong feelings, but I, I won't say that I'm always right. Uh, so we'll, we'll have that discussion at a later time. The last verse is verse 30. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Now that's where they were already serving, but apparently they, get, they all three got promotions. And uh, so we see them getting promoted. And I think we're going to see that God is working in Nebuchadnezzar's heart though he certainly has given no testimony of having accepted or received or believed in the God of Israel as his personal God and been ready to throw away the others. But we'll see as God continues to work in his heart because next week in chapter 4, we'll see that Nebuchadnezzar has a very momentous occasion in his own life where God, I think, is trying to bring him to a point of conversion. It's a very interesting chapter. By the way, chapter 4 of Daniel is the only portion of the Old Testament where a Gentile wrote part of the Bible. I think you're going to find it interesting, but that's for next week. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for a chance to study the book of Daniel. I pray, dear God, that we would not only find it interesting, but Lord, we would find those things that are relevant to our own lives and seek to live by the Word of God. Lord, help us to be excited about you and about your word enough that we'll tell other people this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.